and gentlemen, I am going to go ahead and get us started so that we have as much time as possible for what is sure to be a stimulating discussion. My name is Lisa Schultz. I'm the co-director of the of the Murphy Institute for Catholic Law, Thought, and, Thought, Law, and Public Policy. Um, the Murphy Institute is a joint venture between the Center for Catholic Studies and the School of Law here at St. Thomas. And this program series um, explores from different perspectives issues that are of interest to people of various faith traditions and political perspectives. Um, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that our CLE approval number is up there. A couple of upcoming programs from the Murphy Institute are also described up there. And these beautiful little orange flyers describe next week's program over in the St. Paul campus on feminism, law, and religion. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for today's program, um, Mitch Gordon, who is the director of our um, Department of Legal, uh, the, uh, Department of Lawyering Skills. He secretly harbors the ambition to be called Dean of the <laughs> Department of Lawyering Skills, um, but is known colloquially around here as the uh, Jimmy Fallon of St. Thomas Law School. So we will all be in very good hands. Mitch? Well, that was lousy. Um, so I, I had said um, two things to Professor Schultz um, just before the program. One was that uh, uh, I never want to be called dean of anything. Uh, and the other was um, that uh, she asked me if I'd watched the Jimmy Fallon show yet. And I said, yeah, and I didn't think he was very good at monologues. So, so thank you. Thank you for that, for that uh, fine introduction. Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the University of St. Thomas School of Law. I am Mitchell Gordon. Uh, we're here today for the latest uh, Hot Topics Cool Talk Forum presented by the Murphy Institute for Catholic Thought, Law, and Public Policy. And today's event is the final one of the 2013-2014 uh, series. Uh, and we're going to consider today one of the most hotly contested disputes over religious freedom, which is religious objections to politically progressive social welfare uh, regulation. Uh, objections that in themselves uh, raise some difficult questions. Uh, is there a basic uh, incompatibility between political progressivism and broad religious freedom? Uh, can we have a strong secular government that also strongly protects religious freedom? What is the proper definition of religious freedom? What's its proper scope? Uh, and how far should courts or legislatures go uh, to accommodate those who object on religious grounds to social welfare laws and regulations? So to answer these questions completely uh, and to replace them with new questions, uh, we have uh, two experts, uh, Laura Undercuffler and Tom Berg. Uh, professor Undercuffler is the J. Duprat White Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at Cornell Law School, uh, where she teaches an introductory course in property as well as advanced courses in uh, land use and property theory. Uh, she's published widely in the United States and abroad uh, in the fields of property theory, constitutional law, and the role of moral decision making in law. Uh, she's also been involved in international projects concerning uh, property rights and regime change and the problem of corruption and democratic governance. Uh, professor Tom Berg, uh, well known to us, is the uh, James L. Oberstar Professor of Law and Public Policy here at the University of St. Thomas School of Law, where he teaches constitutional law. Uh, Professor Berg is one of the leading scholars of law and religion in the United States. He's written more than 30 briefs on issues of religious liberty and free speech in cases in the United States Supreme Court uh, and lower courts, and has often testified uh, to Congress in support of legislation protecting religious freedom. Our format for today uh, is as follows. We'll start with uh, Professor Undercuffler, uh, who will have uh, 12 minutes, up to 12 minutes, I should say, um, to speak, and then uh, Professor Berg will have uh, 12 minutes. Uh, and then I thought we'd give Professor Undercuffler uh, five minutes to respond before opening up to uh, questions and answers. Uh, now, as you know, we hand out uh, cards, index cards, uh, for those who are, if you're interested in, in posing a question for the Q&A, uh, then feel free, who's, who's collecting the cards? And is there, any, is there any significance to the color of the cards? None whatsoever. None, none whatsoever, folks. OK. Uh, 
Now, some of the chatter leads me to believe that perhaps Professor Berg would like to go first, and I'm going to let them decide. Um, and so my last comment to you will be, thank you for coming today. Uh, and remember, this is for educational purposes only, so no wagering, please. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I can. Okay. We're having fr frantic discussions here up front uh, about who goes first. Uh, so I think, we're, I think we're right. And I am Tom Berg, not or Laura Undercutler. Uh, uh, but I'm very happy to welcome Laura here to the law school. Uh, I've uh, known her work for a long time. We've only just met a couple of times at conferences, and it's really great to have her, have her as a debate partner. Uh, so I'm very happy to. Uh, to be participating. I'm going to give you a PowerPoint presentation here that I am going to whip through pretty quickly. And it's called A Progressive Case for Broad Religious Freedom. Uh, it starts off with, uh, as uh, Professor Gordon described, the increasingly heated conflicts between religious freedom claims and what we would commonly call progressive laws. For example, gay rights and same-sex marriage versus organizations and individuals who object to directly facilitating uh, a, a marriage or a, a relationship. Uh, there are the religious adoption uh, services uh, like Catholic Charities. Uh, there are the cases of the wedding photographer and the florist. Uh, second big uh, controversy, uh, the mandate uh, in the Affordable Care Act or under the Affordable Care Act to cover contraception in health employer provided health insurance, including contracept forms of contraception that uh, are claimed to uh, possibly have uh, abortifacient uh, 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 operation uh, by preventing the implantation of a newly fertilized uh, emb embryo in the uterus. This is the Hobby Lobby case that's before the Supreme Court and will be argued in, uh, at the end of this month. Uh, in recent weeks, there have been religious freedom bills introduced in states around the country, uh, and uh, those have uh, provoked uh, intense opposition as well. We'll say a little bit about some, uh, some of those. I think there are some important differences between those uh, bills. All of these uh, issues are examples of a broader question that goes beyond progressivism and religious freedom. Uh, and that is when a general law forces an individual or organization to act in violation of a sincere religious belief or prevents an individual from acting according to uh, a belief, a religious belief, should there be what the law calls an accommodation. That is, an exception made to protect religious freedom while not invalidating the underlying statute entirely but making accommodation as applied in that particular circumstance. That can either happen by a specific statutory provision in a particular context, or it can happen, as I'll explain briefly, by court rulings under a general standard for religious freedom, so specific or general. Uh, let's talk about the general religious freedom standards, a little bit of background. Um, the story uh, starts uh, almost 25 years ago with Employment Division versus Smith, a case decided by the U.S. Supreme Court involving the use sac of, uh, sacramental use of peyote by Native American worshipers. Uh, and in that case, the court uh, held that there is no right under the First Amendment's Free Exercise Clause for a religious believer or organization to be exempt from a, quote, neutral, generally applicable law. In that case, a, a law, a state law against the use of peyote as a, uh, as a prohibited drug, uh, but used at the worship services, uh, services by Native Americans. And the court said that is a flat rule. No matter how great the burden on religion, uh, no matter you know, how serious the inability to consume peyote at your worship service is, and no matter how minimal the state's interest, it doesn't matter whether there's a problem with peyote, in general, it doesn't matter whether there's a problem with the use of peyote at this, uh, at, at this uh, ceremony, whether it causes health or, other, or addiction problems or whatever. It's simply a flat rule. If the law is uh, just a, a law against the use of peyote, there's no religious exception. In response to that, uh, uh, the federal uh, Congress and a number of states 
uh, have passed statutes called Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, or RIFRAs, uh, that adopt a uh, broader standard. And this, a similar kind of standard has also been adopted by state courts uh, under their own constitution. So uh, the result is that in, under federal laws and in 27 states, we have a more protective standard for religious freedom. And that more pr protective standard is that substantial burdens on religious exercise must be justified by a compelling interest, and they must be the, quote, least restrictive means of achieving that interest. That is markedly greater protection, usually for minority faiths, uh, because it gives an, uh, them the chance to argue for an exception from a law that the majority political branches have passed and at least put the government to a showing uh, that there's a real need to apply this law to, uh, uh, to uh, substantially burden religious exercise. The controversies about pro uh, progressive laws and religious freedom arise out of the application of these general standards, uh, uh, in particular the standard under RIFRA, what is a compelling interest and what is a least less restrictive means, what is a substantial burden, but also controversies over whether to have not a general standard, but a specific statutory exemption in some cases. For example, in a same-sex marriage law. As uh, same-sex marriage laws have been introduced in the states, there have been exemptions of various sorts uh, included for religious organizations. My argument is that uh, there are uh, that although this is a matter that seems to be dividing uh, progressives and conservatives uh, quite sharply now, I'm going to make perha the perhaps somewhat counterintuitive argument that there are progressive arguments for broad religious freedom, even for religious views and conduct that progressives oppose. Uh, and I'm going to offer three kinds of reasons. Before I say that, let me, let me just say a brief uh, personal word. Um, I, I usually wouldn't talk about my broad personal views because I think what's relevant are the arguments, but uh, I think this, this issue has become so uh, polarized in uh, recent weeks, months, um, that um, people make assumptions about where you're coming from if you argue one side or, or the other. Um, so, uh, uh, for, for the record, I'm a supporter of same-sex marriage. I've argued, uh, filed a brief in the United States Supreme Court arguing that there ought to be same-sex marriage rights in, in all 50 states as a matter of the Constitution. Uh, I'm a, I'm a pro-life uh, advocate, but I also supported, supported the Affordable Care Act and have made arguments for that in, in writing. Uh, so I find myself in the position of supporting a lot of the underlying laws that are conflicting with religious objections, and yet uh, wanting to protect religious objectors broadly. And that's, a, I think, a somewhat unusual position, and um, I want to try to explain uh, why I think it's a good position. <laughs> Maybe explain it to myself as well as to you. Um, three reasons for broad protection for religious freedom. Number one is what I call reciprocal liberty. Liberals have historically supported uh, religious freedom, among uh, other rights. Liberal justices on the Supreme Court have been great supporters of religious freedom uh, over, over the years. And I think if we, you could summarize a reason for that very, very briefly, it's the, uh, the, the, uh, the preference for protecting uh, the vulnerable and for protecting differences uh, among people as much as possible. This is something that liberals believe in. Uh, and religion is one of those things on which people are vulnerable. It's not the only thing, but it's one of the things on which people are vulnerable. It's central to believers. One of the definitions of religion is that it's a central feature of identity that binds, binds your, your identity together. Uh, so that people are vulnerable to harm if they can't live according to their faith, if the state prevents them from living according to their faith. The state and federal RIFRAs, Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, that, ha that have protected religious freedom have therefore had the effect often of protecting religious minorities. Native Americans, Sikhs, Muslims, Saturday observers. I could list you all the cases. We could talk about them in the, in the, in the question and answer. 
uh, session. They protected religious minorities. They've also protected the social service work that religious organizations do, food pantries, homeless shelters, and so on. Uh, I believe that the uh, protection of those statutes should extend presumptively to religious conservatives as well. And uh, that's where the, these issues come in. I argue that this is recipro uh, reciprocal sympathy, or that's a, help, a helpful way to think about it, or reciprocal li liberty, at least in the case of uh, gay rights and religious freedom. Uh, and here's how. Uh, the denial of civil marriage, it seems to be the, 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 case, uh, the best case against denying civil marriage, or the case for civil marriage, is that denying it burdens same-sex couples um, with respect to a relationship that is central to their identity and integrity. The same thing, I think, is true for the religious believer who is forced to contradict his faith. Uh, religious belief is central to identity and integrity, and so there is a, a similar kind of harm there, and we ought to try to protect both to the extent we can. Particularly, the state, there, there are parallels between the two. The state should not tell gays and lesbians you don't need to act on your orientation. You have an orientation, but conduct is a different thing. Okay, well, we, we, we um, re reject that in general as being um, unsympathetic to the lives of gay uh, people. Um, it also, though, parallel, should not tell the religious adherent, you have your belief, and that's fine, you know, get your belief, That's the two minutes. Have. Okay, boy, wow. Okay, you have your religious belief, but don't act on it unless there's a strong reason. The state also should not. Uh, another parallel: the state should not tell gays and lesbians keep your relationship private. Uh, uh, but it shouldn't tell religious believers just keep your religion in church, and don't bring it out into the public sphere. Okay, I can see I'm going to have to scoot here. Um, second reason. Religious freedom is not just a private thing, because religion is not just a private thing, and progressives should recognize that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the HHS mandate. Let, let me just uh, uh, skip over that and say that in many of these instances, these, de these debates, these disputes, the, art, the, the, the proponents of the progressive statutes have said the only exception for religion ought to be for the church and the clergy. It should not extend to the religiously based service ministry. An example of that in the HHS case, Emily's List sent out a flyer dismissing Catholic charities and other religious uh, social services as so-called religious organizations. I think progressives, especially religious progressives, ought to be upset at that kind of dismissal of service organizations as not really uh, relig uh, religious. There's a tremendous irony in doing that because it is, in fact, the uh, a central tenet of the liberal forms of faith. And what progressives value about faith is the service work that it does for others. And if that's what we exclude from protection, uh, I think we're really making a mistake with respect to progressive uh, values. Um, we also shouldn't lightly jeopardize the contributions of faith-based uh, services. The Catholic Charities uh, adoption case uh, dispute where Catholic Charities has pulled out of adoption services in two states in the District of Columbia shows that we will lose beneficial, we may lose beneficial services unless we make some sort of accommodation for them. Uh, For-profit corporations, I think, pre present a more uh, difficult case, and I admit that, but I don't want to exclude them from protection entirely, so I'll say something about that at the very end of the presentation. The third argument for accommodation is that it makes pragmatic sense. Religious accommodations often increase the chances of passing the underlying legislation by answering religious liberty objections. Again, same-sex marriage provides an example. Uh, and I'll, I'll read through this. In several states, propo uh, this is Professor Robin Wilson has documented this, protection, uh, proposed legislation enacting same-sex marriage, offering protection only to the clergy, failed to garner enough support to become law. 
And then a few months later, revised bills passed with more expansive protection covering religious schools and social services. The New York Times reported that in New York, expanded religious accommodations were the most pivotal feature and helped pull the legislation over the finish line. It's possible to, uh, to promote both values. The only way to do that, though, is to have meaningful accommodations. I'm going to... Um, leave with, the, uh, with some very quick initial thoughts about where to draw the lines. I believe that we should protect religious nonprofit organizations uh, meaningfully. Ultimately, in the uh, Hobby Lobby or the HHS mandate case, the, uh, the Obama administration did protect them with an accommodation that we can talk about that has the uh, insurer pay, and I think that was actually a pretty good solution. In the commercial sphere, uh, that's the hardest question. I do think that uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, a real uh, uh, con concern about making sure that people have access to goods and services in society. I, I grant that uh, cheerfully. Uh, but exemptions I don't think should be rule out, ruled out. We, could, we can craft exemptions to protect somebody like the individual wedding photographer, florist, or marriage counselor who's directly involved in promoting the marriage where there are lots of alternative providers, when there are lots of alternative providers, we could do that and protect conscience without harming access to services. Even if we don't do that, though, even if we say you go into business and you can't make a, uh, an, uh, a, have a religious exemption from an anti-discrimination law, I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater and oppose religious freedom statutes as has happened in the uh, at least with one uh, one or two statutes in the last few weeks, and we can say more about that in the questions. What the last thought, um, last line? Let's think carefully about these questions. I think it requires careful thinking in order to be able to protect religious liberty along with other values. Thanks. tethered to this, this instrument here, so I will uh, try not to mess that part up. Um, good afternoon. I appreciate very much the opportunity to address you uh, today. The question that we are dealing with, uh, how religious freedom can coexist with government is obviously a very important and very difficult one. I am very appreciative of Tom's uh, work in this area. I think that he is trying to do uh, what we are all trying to do, which is come to some reconciliation. I simply have a different approach or a different perspective, uh, which I thought I would share with you today. For 20 years, I have written about the importance of freedom of conscience and religion in public life and in the lives of individuals. Uh, and I think that at the moment, we are at a crossroads here of growing hostility to religion and those of us who are, uh, in fact, religious need to uh, deal with this problem. First of all, a note about religious conscience and progressive politics. We tend to see these at odds. Religious conscience means individual autonomy to act as conscience dictates, while progressive politics uh, involves the continual subjection of individuals to so-called collective notions of the good. I can understand why this is the way it seems to be. However, I would argue first that this short changes both of the uh, ideas. First of all, religious conscience. What is religious conscience? Uh, I have several different characteristics of it that I think are important. First of all, it refers to principles that transcend politics and collective decision making. It is, in other words, of God. Secondly, it implicates the use of reason. It involves an element of compulsion, and it's interestingly acknowledged by law as a rare instance of recognition of individual moral responsibility, something that I have been thinking about for a long time. 
So in other words, I think that religious conscience is important not only for the substantive principles it may generate, but for the process that it actually represents. It's one of the few indictments recognized by law against the use of the existence of law or the existence of collective judgments as a justification for failure to make moral inquiry. Extremely important, uh, I believe. As Ann Patrick has written, in reality, conscience is a very social phenomenon. In this context, the individual is always a self in relation to others. It's also interesting to observe that of all constitutional rights and guaranteed personal freedoms, conscience is the most intrinsically relational. Only personal freedom, this is the only personal freedom that is rooted in and imposes an obligation of moral agency. It's the only one that subtly contradicts the individualistic notions that otherwise may abound and reminds us of the social fabric of which we are all a part. Uh, in other words, it reminds us of our relationships to others in the context of moral choice. So I would say, first of all, conscience is not only reconcilable with progressivism and the idea of collective notions of the good, it is in fact a critical part of that endeavor. This quality of conscience, this otherness of conscience, I think should inform the questions we're confronting today. As Tom described, as of late, progressivism has been associated with certain social visions, universal health insurance requirements, same-sex marriage equality, and so on. Um, the question is, I believe, how should religion approach these demands of the secular order? First of all, a few background uh, principles. As we all know, government cannot question the sincerity of religious beliefs or the compelled nature of religious beliefs. Under the First Amendment, the definition of religion, the understanding of its commands, and so forth, are left to the adherent alone. Furthermore, we cannot, perhaps unfortunately, pick and choose among sects, uh, those we like, those we don't like, those that are useful to society, those that are not useful to society. Uh, we have to treat, as a legal matter, all of them on an equal footing. In addition, it's apparent to me, at least, that at some point, religious conscience, religion, must accept the authority of secular law. Ob obviously, uh, some religious practices could be extremely destructive or even evil. Uh, if murder was a central tenet of a religious faith, we obviously, as a society, could not bow to that demand. So the question is not whether there is a line that needs to be drawn. The question is where the line is. Now, in locating this line, uh, Tom has talked about the important interests of the religious actor, the need for accommodation by secular government. I think those are important, but I think there is something else here that is often missing from the uh, dialogue, and I think that the fact that this is missing is what is creating some of the growing hostility to religion in public life. Um, there is actually a strange twist to religious jurisprudence in the way we normally, as a matter of culture, as well as law, frame religious claims. And interestingly, I've only very recently become aware of this. I was asked to uh, testify in the Maine legislature regarding their proposed state, RIFRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And listening to the conversation, I suddenly became aware, I don't know why I never was previously, that all of the emphasis seemed to be on the individual religious adherent and what the individual adherent would lose if this legislation were not passed. I didn't hear any real grappling with what the other individuals would lose uh, or any account of it uh, in the conversation. Take, for instance, the example of same-sex marriage. We tend to think of this as religious freedom on one side and the demands of the state in enforcing notions of its notions of equality on the other. Because of this approach, I think, when we stack up the real harm to the religious individual against this abstract policy of equality, the abstract policy of equality tends to pale. Um, in fact, I think that we as religious people often frame the issue this way, and it tends to obscure the fact that we really here have antagonistic individual forces. We tend to want to believe the religious objector can have his freedom to object, 
a same-sex couple can marry under secular law. Each can coexist without interference by the other. Freedom is afforded to everyone. Conflict is solved. Now, I think if we're talking about private life and private actions, the religious organization's private affairs, this model works. Not much problem. However, what I want to suggest is that when it comes to experience in public life, the stakes are different, the harms are different, and this model of benign disengagement simply is inadequate. Take, for instance, the, an issue that was litigated to the bitter end in the United States, the question of racial discrimination on religious grounds. As you all know, ultimately, the United States Supreme Court decided this question. Uh, religious institutions, profit or nonprofit, cannot engage in racial discrimination in their public accommodations, services, and interactions. Religious organization cannot refuse to provide publicly available lodging and so forth to a black person or interracial couple. In other words, in the public sphere, racism is out. Now, I think that today, none of us would question this. It doesn't matter in this context, apparently, what claim of freedom is lost by the religious person. Uh, why? Because we perceive and understand the harm to the other individuals that this exclusion causes. In other words, it's not just the freedom to be black that the black person wants. It's the freedom to be treated equally with others in public services, accommodations, facilities, goods, and so on. It's not a question of whether the black person or inter interracial couple can find someone else to provide the service or the accommodation. It's the denial itself that causes the hurt, the harm, the second class status, which our laws cannot endorse. Now, consider the gay, lesbian, transgender, same-sex marriage context. Somehow, I think as religious people, we hope that they are not so harmed by refusal to serve or to house or to be dealt with publicly. Somehow we hope that because there are alternatives, their loss or pain is not something of which we need to be particularly legally cognizant. I believe, however, that this is a mistake. Uh, I think we must examine what this approach means. Can we, as religious individuals, assume this kind of unawareness of the needs of others? For gay, lesbian, transgender persons, the solution of alternatives to them means that their interests and humanness are swept under the rug by the religious organization or the individual who seeks the exemption, and even more important, that the state grants this. I think the bottom line is that we assume in this country, a liberal democratic order, that citizenship, political power, civic participation in all of its forms must be granted to all members on an equal basis. If religious individuals and organizations choose to serve the public, they must be cognizant of this basic principle. Now, the human rights cases I've been talking about are perhaps the most extreme and the most obvious, but I don't think that the failure to consider the interests of others and the resulting hostility to religion is limited to this context. In the post-RIFRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and post-RILUPA, Religious Land Use an Institutionalized Persons Act world in which we live, both federal and state, there are in fact many cases in which sharp individual rights and interests oppose religious claims. For instance, recently a federal court of appeals held that the Texas Religious Freedom Restoration Act required that urban property owners must tolerate religious goat slaughter in the next door neighbor's backyard regardless of zoning laws, property loss values, and trauma to neighboring children. After the ruling was announced, the attorney for the religious claimant stated to the press, quote, it's a great day for religious freedom, unquote. However, the local press wrote, quote, local citizens are learning the hard way of the two-edged nature of religious rights. There was also a very well-publicized uh, statement by a commentator at USC recently who wrote in response to the National Religious Freedom Day about, quote, religiously motivated oppression and aggression by religions, unquote. Now, I'm not saying that religious claims should be disregarded legally or that religious people should just roll over and accept the end of the particular status of religion across the board, either in life or in law. Nor am I saying that religious claims as an automatic matter should be inferior to others. 
many of the cases that are cited uh, in this area are ones where, in fact, that was the case, where religious claims were, in fact, treated as inferior to others. I'm not making that argument. What I am saying is that we, as religious individuals and institutions, must seriously and genuinely grapple with the reciprocal rights of others that oppose our claims. We simply cannot advance this idea that our concerns automatically trump what the concerns of others are. In other words, I would say we must recognize the otherness of religious conscience. And I'd say this is important not only as a moral or considerate matter, but ultimately as the only way to address what I see as growing hostility to religion and religious claims in this increasingly uh, heterogeneous society. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you, Laura. That's uh, important points. Um, let me talk about the race analogy first, because uh, it's uh, it's a it's it's a very troublesome one for arguing for broad exemptions. That's a, that's a challenge. Um, I also think it's a puzzle for Laura's position, though, too. Uh, because if we look at the treatment of race discrimination under the law, we find virtually no exemptions anywhere. It's not simply in the commercial sphere. It's not simply the restaurant. It's not simply the, the photographer. Um, it, uh, there's no exemptions for racial discrimination in much of the nonprofit religious sphere either. Uh, the main case by the Supreme Court uh, on this involved a small fundamentalist college in South Carolina, Bob Jones University, uh, that accepts people who have uh, chosen to go there for their, uh, you know, for a very particular kind of Christian fundamentalist belief. And at the time, uh, they pro prohibited interracial dating. Uh, and the uh, Supreme Court said uh, the government took away, the federal government uh, withdrew their tax exemption, and the Supreme Court upheld that and said there is a compelling interest in eradicating ir uh, racial discrimination. Um, if race is the analogy, then we are, we will, the result will be far more than to ensure that uh, people can, you know, receive services from florists and photographers and bakers, et cetera. It will mean that to the extent that any evangelical college has a policy uh, against same-sex relationships among students or a role, uh, a role model kind of policy for faculty, um, it should at least lose its tax exemption. Uh, same with, thing with a lot of traditionalist Catholic organizations and uh, others. It's not simply the uh, Supreme Court decision, but if you look through the statutes of the states, you find lots of exemptions uh, concerning re religious discrimination. You find exemptions concerning discrimination based on marital status and sexual orientation. The law in the states over and over again has struck balances there. Repeatedly in states, you find exemptions that leave out race or specifically say race is not one of these. For example, I just think, just think of one. Uh, there was a same sex marriage debate in Hawaii a couple, uh, few months ago that uh, I uh, was involved in. Hawaii says a religious organization can favor members of its own faith in renting uh, property to the to them, you know, maybe for, you know, kind of uh, homeless or, or, you know, tied people over uh, or whatever, um, as long as membership in the religious organization is not conditioned on race. Uh, that's, we have treated these different contexts differently. There are even some exemptions in federal law for sex discrimination for religious organizations that do not exist for race discrimination. Uh, 
I, it's, it's a tough position to draw nuances between different kinds of discrimination that have all been painful and harmful to people. But the contexts are different, and the law has treated the contexts different. Um, my best explanation, as I thought about the race situation, uh, the race context, is that we had a, an overwhelming problem that led to a uh, civil war and hundreds of thousands of deaths, amendments to the Constitution, decades of further uh, segregation, massive resistance to civil rights laws, uh, and a, a thoroughgoing um, oppression. In that context, not to diminish discrimination in other contexts, but just to talk about the uniqueness of that context. We, our society took a really harsh approach towards religious dissent in the context of racial discrimination. Should, you know, should we rethink that? Should there be more room for a Bob Jones fundamentalist college? Maybe some argument for that. I think at the point we are now, though, that would send a message of retreat on racial discrimination, which is still a problem in society. And uh, that it would not be a good message to send. It doesn't follow, in my view, that we have to adopt exactly the same approach for all other significant problems of discrimination that come along. Maybe we can use a slightly less coercive approach in, uh, in treating other, uh, other problems, and it might be, it might be more product, productive in leading to uh, the ability of d different groups to, to, uh, to coexist. Now, that doesn't say where the line should be. Um, you know, maybe the answer is that the commercial sphere, there just should not be exemptions. Uh, but it's just to say that I don't think the race, I think the race analogy proves a lot more than what Laura is saying. That's, that's my time? Okay, good. Well, more, more, to, more to come. Thank you. Oh, I get five minutes? Uh, I guess I have uh, five minutes here to uh, make a brief rebuttal. Um, race is different. Yes, I, I know that is definitely uh, something that is uh, discussed. I guess to me the question is whether or not the particular discrimination is based on identity. In other words, is it discrimination based on intrinsic human characteristics? or not. Uh, we have not only race discrimination as prohibited, we have national origin discrimination, we have gender discrimination, we have religious discrimination on a religious identity. Uh, all of these are prohibited by law. Now, do we allow exemptions, religious exemptions in these other instances? Um, I do not believe, for instance, in housing, right? We have the uh, Federal Fair Housing Act. I do not believe that somebody could refuse to rent to someone because that person was a Mexican or was a Jew or was a Catholic or whatever. That is prohibited by federal law. I guess the question really boils down to, <laughs> do you consider same-sex uh, marriage, married people, or do you consider gay and lesbian people in the same group with these other individuals? That's really the question. Is it the same as national origin, gender, religious identity, and so forth? Or as I've put in one article, is it a part of this group of what we as a society have termed odious discrimination? That's the word used by the U.S. Supreme Court. To me, it's the same. I mean, <laughs> to me, uh, sexual orientation, transgender status, and so forth is simply as intrinsic as any of these other characteristics. Now, there are people who disagree with that, and then they're going to come to a different conclusion. I don't think Tom is one of them, but 
Um, so the only thing I would leave you with is every time we see we should be able to discriminate against a same-sex couple, whether it's an institution, an individual who's involved in commerce or whatever it is, if we substitute the word interracial, would we accept it? And I think almost invariably the answer would be no. So then the question becomes why the difference in treatment? Is there a way to justify uh, different treatment of people on the basis of what I would call intrinsic human characteristics? Well, we do have time for a few questions, um, and uh, I'm going to start with questions that are directed to both of our speakers. Um, the first is, uh, might some of these issues have no satisfactory resolution at law? <laughs> it's for both. We stand up to. Oh, that's up to you. But but make clear whether you're speaking as Tom Berg or as Laura Undercutler. <laughs> um, I'll be me. Uh, uh, I guess it depends on what your criterion for a satisfactory resolution is. Um, the law can't. I mean, if if we want to have sort of clear standards that are sort of easily applied and there's no question wh how the next case will come out, then um, you're going to have, you know, you, you have to say something like, you know, no, no exemptions from any kind of neutral, generally applicable law. That's what Justice Scalia did in the Smith case. And he likes clear rules. And that's why, uh, that's why he adopted that. Uh, the, the, the argument against that has been that it can't, ta can't take account of the, the many different situations in which religious practice comes in conflict with the law, and we want to try to accommodate. Uh, so, uh, you know, so that, there's a big question there. Is it, is it worth it? Um, is it worth it to, ha to try to make any kind of distinction between race and other intrinsic human characteristics, which I, I do accept? Um, I think it's a hard distinction to make, and I under, very much understand people uh, who are uh, leery about making any distinction between race and sexual orientation, how we handle those two things at all. But I would come back to the question, not about the commercial situation, but what are you going to, if, if, you, if you substitute race in for every situation that we have, then virtually every evangelical and traditional Catholic, not pro, you know, college, small social service, et cetera, should have its tax exemption taken away, should be fully subject to the anti-discrimination laws. With race, we've gone a lot, a lot further than just the commercial sphere where, with which I you know, really understand the, the concerns about that. Um, and so uh, I think it's worth having some, some nuanced and fine-grained distinctions to balance values. That's, uh, but that's a choice between hard and fast rules and nuance ones, or I call them nuance, but you know, <laughs> balancing like that. I think it's incredibly difficult uh, to have a blunt instrument such as law dealing with these incredibly complex questions, which, of course, as Tom mentioned, I think is one reason why Justice Scalia came down as he did in the Smith case. You know, it's ironic in a way that Justice Scalia, the, one of the most uh, protective of religious freedom of justices in the last three or four decades, would in fact author the Smith case, right? I mean, it seems very contradictory. Why would he in fact move to eliminate religious, uh, special religious protections when he himself is so consistently concerned with it? Um, I think the reason is because of the difficulty in this area. You know, there is no golden bullet or, or formula that's going to answer all of these issues. In my own position, and I thought a lot about this, okay, so what do I suggest, right? Uh, I don't want to say that there is no special consideration for religion. On the other 
hand, I don't want to say that it, when it comes to certain uh, settings that we ignore the interests on the other side, both because I think it's bad for, uh, as a societal matter, and it's very bad for religion. So where, where do we come out? And the only place I can think of to come out is to say somehow the traditional formula that the so-called compelling interest test it just notably lacks any concern for the other. And I think that's really the political problem. Um, not Tom's position, but the, the position that's often out there lacks any concern for the other. Um, does that mean we now have a, some kind of test that's going to yield an answer in every case? No. I don't, I don't think it's possible. Uh, our next question is also for both speakers. Uh, if it becomes possible for an organization to make a profit-motivated decision to espouse a given set of religious values, what standard of proof should be required to back the designation as a religious organization? That is, how do we avoid a get-out-of-jail-free system on all sorts of discriminatory practices? I'll, if, if it's okay, I'll start on that one. Um, I actually encountered this kind of question when I was a lawyer in practice here in, in uh, Minnesota. And it is, I think, extraordinarily difficult because for those of us who believe that religion is something that affects all of our lives, obviously, number one, it affects all of our lives and all aspects of our lives. And number two, the state is not in a position, I do not believe, according to the US Supreme Court and practically speaking, not in a position to judge whether or not certain actions by a nonprofit profit or whatever are religious or not. That's why, to me, the, the dividing line has to be public activities versus private activities, not, partic not really the identity of the actor, okay? Because the identity of the actor is something we honestly can't evaluate, right? Anybody says, I'm a religious person and I believe that X is, is required. There's no judge or legislature that can uh, evaluate that uh, assertion. So I think the only thing we can say is if you're in the private sphere, within your own private sphere, whether it's an individual or an organization, religious organization or otherwise, you can do what you want. But if you are engaging the public in a commercial setting, if you are engaging the public in uh, services to the public, broadly speaking, not just to your own members, but to the so forth and so on, then I think we have to apply the rules even-handedly. So, so I don't mean to harp on this, but what, what it, you, you keep talking about the public sphere and the commercial right. sphere versus the private sphere. Right. And the problem is, setting aside you know, the, the florist and Hobby Lobby, there's this vast sphere in the middle of nonprofits that are not churches. They're colleges, right. they're social services, they're, they're, many of them are deeply religious. Uh, and, you know, uh, what, what, what are they? I certainly, understand, I certainly understand the idea that, that progressives emphasize some sort of obligations to the community. Uh, but those institutions are also trying to promote sort of communal values themselves. They're sort of values within the organization and usually values of trying to serve others while maintaining an identity. Um, a friend of mine named Stanley Carlson Thies who, who works on protecting, you know, faith-based social services, that call, uh, uh, so on, has this slow uh, description of what he does is trying to free these institutions so that they can serve, consistent with their identity, right? They're trying to help people. They're trying to food, food kitchens. They're, they're doing lots of things like that. Um, what about that vast sphere in the middle, which has, as law has developed over the last 30, 40 years, more and more of that has been classified as public for reasons that I understand, but do we have no exemptions in that sphere once, you know, once the government says there's any interest in discrimination, in preventing discrimination in that sphere, and I think there is, does that mean we automatically can't have any exemptions to strike the balance? Well, I mean, I, 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 yeah, so I, I, <laughs> I, I guess I would out. say that's the inevitable conclusion, right? <laughs> if you're going to 
what exactly is a religious nonprofit? You know, we all have an image of a religious nonprofit that is, I think, very positive because of our experience with religious nonprofits. But what really is, technically speaking, a religious nonprofit? It's some people who claim a religious belief, which we cannot examine, right? That are in fact structured in a certain way so that they are nonprofit under the law. I mean, unfortunately, when we're dealing with the law, okay, we can't discriminate between these organizations, which we think are extremely worthy, and these organizations, which we think are shams, uh, you know, whatever, not not really the t of the type we want to protect. There, there is the law has failed in this kind of. Distinction. Now, I understand the U.S. Supreme Court has, in a couple of cases, emphasized the nonprofit nature of certain things, most notably the uh, Amos case. But I think as time goes by, this is going to become more and more problematic. You know, if you, as a religious individual or organization, whether you're nonprofit or profit, if you are engaging, opening your doors to the community at large, then my position would be you have to treat members of the community at large equally because that's what the society demands. Um, it's unfortunate because many, I think, organizations that are extremely worthy and so on are not going to want to do this. But just as they have done it in the case of race discrimination, just as they have done it in the case of religious discrimination, just as they have done it in the case of gender discrimination, I think they can do it in the case of this particular identity-based discrimination. That, that's basically my position. Um, qu quickly, I bet that, so the result is if we want to say that Carleton, if it has mar married student housing, cannot exclude a same-sex couple, that's and I correct. think that's at Big Grab, we want, we want to say that, then we have to say the same thing for Bethel if and Bethel, Northwestern College. If Bethel is holding itself out as a, an institution open to the public, not something where uh, it's, it's a ministry or something of this nature. If it's, if it's open to all comers, yes, I think it does. Just as they have to accept Jews, Catholics, Muslims, and so forth, I think they have to sec accept uh, same-sex people. That's, you know, yeah, what, oh, what if they don't have to, what if they can discriminate religiously in admissions as, and employment as, they, as there are exemptions for? There are exemptions, but those exemptions almost always deal with the fact that these are ministers or people who are involved in the actual propagation of a faith. This is not a, that's a different situation. I don't think this is a case of ministerial uh, activity. Next question. Do exemptions for people of faith discriminate against people of no faith at all who are unable to exercise similar claims? Sorry, sorry. I mean, I'm happy to address that. Uh, yes, there. This this gets to the whole question of the privileged status of religion generally under the Constitution. Religion has a very odd status. On the one hand, it's the most protected of uh, belief systems. On the other hand, it's the most uh, restrained of belief systems through the Establishment Clause. Does that special status for religious conscience under the Constitution, free exercise and so on, does that discriminate against people who are not claiming to be religious? Yes. I think the short answer is yes. Uh, we went through a long history of the so-called equality movement in this country, in the academic world at least, and I think to some extent in the U.S. Supreme Court where uh, people claim that this was a violation of equality to recognize the special status of religious claims. Uh, quite a few of us uh, didn't agree with that position, but it is a compelling argument, right? It is, but I think when you've got a First Amendment that says freedom of religion is something special, we need to treat it as something special. That's my view. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> point of agreement between our two speakers. Let me please ask you to join me in thanking John Harris, our program manager who organizes all of these programs and has done such an incredible job um, with conceiving of and administering this series for the past three years. And our moderator, Mitch, and our two speakers, Professors Berg and Undercutler. Thank you.